understood understanding. A misunderstood understanding. I want to thank Pastor McVicker for giving me this opportunity to come and share for the weekend with the church family. And now this opportunity to share specifically with the church family in the preaching of the Lord's word. A misunderstood understanding. The presupposition is that there is something that we understand that I want to argue that we misunderstood argue with James and arguing this not so much from the verbalizations of those who act like they understand what I'm going to argue they misunderstood not predicated upon the verbalizations because there are those who can talk it can I talk plain there are those that can talk a good faith. They can talk it to the point that you will be looking behind their backs for wings. Because they will have you thinking they've got two wings to fly away. But I want to argue it from the sense of the praxis of the faith. Um, that for one to have understood what they are supposed to understand, that is juxtaposed to verbalizations and praxis. Let me say that another way. That one's faith is not just calling the name of Jesus but it's living the name of Jesus. James. This older brother of our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ had an understanding of religion, religion, uh, belief in and a worshiping of a divine. For Christians, it's a belief in God as personified and experienced and as seen in Jesus the Christ. For Jesus said, when you have seen me, you have seen the Father. For the Father and I are one. Religion. A belief in the presence of a God in Jesus the Christ. A Christ who was with God from the very beginning, from the Johannine perspective, uh, that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God in the beginning. And the Word, 14, chapter 1, became flesh and dwelt among us full of grace and truth. So John has the understanding that there was not an absence of Christ even in creation. And this Christ that was with God from the very beginning uh, is the half-brother of James, our writer of this text. James, an older brother of Jesus, a son of Joseph, uh, who lived with skepticism and doubt of this younger brother of his that was strange, strange like his second cousin John, John the Baptist, uh, the son of Elizabeth and Zechariah. Second cousins uh, in an earthly perspective that Jesus and John, they were strange young men. I don't know what they would have put them on in preschool. Uh, James, the older brother, uh, had a lot of responsibility being that older and having younger siblings by his father, Joseph, and then taking this young woman into his mama's house 
And now this young baby, this boy is in the house, the apple of her eye. But Joseph dies, and now the responsibility for the household is to James, the elder brother. Though they called him a carpenter, I'm not sure, Pastor McVicker, that Jesus ever adapted or adopted the profession of a carpenter. Uh, I think he did. He tinkered around the shop, but most of his time, as we understand, would have been spent as he was wandering and walking and talking and dressing strange and eating locusts and wild honey and talking to the water and, and looking at trees and just sitting and almost in a yoga position and saying, um, but, but, but recognizing that there was something different. James recognized that there was something different about Jesus, but he didn't buy into it. Uh, can I talk plain? I argue that, uh, and I, I thank God for persons who come to church, but, but, I, but I've been around churches a little while now to realize that everybody who comes to church is not necessarily a Christian. Can I talk that plain? That there are those that would rather be members without commitment than to be Christians with a commitment. They'd rather be members with their names on the roll rather than Christians as stewards, consequently being responsible for all of their acts and actions and knowing that they own nothing. All that they are and all that they have belongs to God. See, I'd rather be a member and then I can be ambivalent and then I can float hither and yonder because I'm still trying to make up my mind. I argue that you, that the most important decision that you will ever make in your life is a decision for Jesus as Lord and Savior. Not your significant other, uh, not your career, but the most important decision that you will ever make, and you ought to make a decision for Jesus as Lord. It's good. I'm glad that you're in the member of the church, and and some of you may have been like me that I I joined the church at a young at well not a young age I was a, a teenager and. And, and the, the reason that I joined, for a couple of reasons. One, that if you weren't a member of my little church in New Jersey, they wouldn't have your funeral at the church. That you had to be a member. And I, I didn't want my mom, if something happened, to have to take me to the funeral home. And she would threaten me. Um, and, and the other reason, that when we had communion, they had uh, fermented wine. Uh, they, they didn't have Welch's, Pastor. They had fermented wine. And, and I remember the deacons, and we had older deacons, and on Communion Sunday, they were standing and sing, drinking of the wine, 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 mm -hmm. drinking of the wine. And I wanted to drink of I heard about Thunderbird, but, uh, uh -huh, come on, brothers, don't y'all, come on now. Uh, but, but I wanted to drink it in the church like everybody else. James is arguing that that's a gross misunderstanding of the faith of Jesus. I think James argues like that epitaph on the north gate, uh, north exit um, of Yellowstone Park. National Geographic for this year is highlighting all the parks, uh, some 408 national uh, and state parks and other parks in other parts of the world. I think they call it the Roosevelt uh, Arc. And on the exiting of that Roosevelt Arc, it says for the benefit and enjoyment of the people. Are you listening? That, that the state parks and national parks are for the benefit and enjoyment of the people. A relationship to God in Christ Jesus <laughs> is for, talk to me somebody, the benefit and enjoyment of the people. Not, not just for me. Um, but, but, but the benefit uh, and enjoyment of 
the people. This James now has been converted. Um, he has embra embraced uh, God's acts and actions in this man, his half-brother Jesus, who has been crucified, been raised, uh, been seen of the apostles and the elders, and has now ascended and is now seated at the right hand of the throne of God, making intercession for our souls. James now writes to believing, practicing Christians. Are you listening? Uh, the, the letter to James is not a letter to seek to help persons to become converted. We, in our terms, it's not an evangelical or evangelizing letter. It's written to, with the understanding that there are persons who have accepted Jesus as Lord and Savior. Uh, it's written to, to persons who gather uh, in worship. It's written to those who have embraced and have been embraced by the Spirit of God Almighty. James writes now to believers. But he writes to them because as he has watched them, he has noticed in the culture and the community in which they are serving, there seems to be a dichotomy in what they say and in what they are doing. 